Hi, I'm Daniel Robinson, and this is Plumpy Thimble. A role-playing game, RPG, and a storytelling board game can look really similar, especially, especially to someone that is uh, not familiar with either one of those types of games. Uh, the main difference being, oftentimes with board games, the story uh, the story is a driving force. You know, there's a narrative throughout the game. It's usually pretty stagnant as far as what's going to happen. Um, but players make decisions, uh, and they oftentimes are trying to score points. It's it's all sort of stuck in this the confines of the rule book. On the flip side, a role playing game, an RPG, is a very open world. It's run by a game master who is. Uh, has to be familiar with the world that you're playing in and has to be familiar with all the rules and basically creates a universe and lets the players loosen them with the, with very loose guidelines and really they can do anything they want. A lot of people, myself included, really enjoy the storytelling aspect of games. Dead of Winter is one of my favorite games and it's because it has a really strong storytelling element. Uh, you know, the zombie theme may be overdone, but the, the stories within Dead of Winter where you're trying to survive, you have to keep your people fed, there's all these different elements going on, you know, the, the story is being fed into the game and you have to deal with it. However, you are not outputting much story in that game. Like you're, you're going through the mechanisms of the game and you're, you know, okay, I'm feeding my people. Uh, but you yourself are not the driving force behind the story in that game. The middle ground between those two where you have open ability to, to tell a story within the confines of a universe, it's a weird spot to try to throw a game into. Now, Pencil First Games decided to take a crack at it with The Sibling's Trouble. The Sibling's Trouble is, the first and foremost, it's a small box game, and anything that's attempting to be any amount of, have any amount of storytelling, generally you don't find too many of them in small boxes. Each player takes on a character, and they're these, these kids, and they are named after whatever attribute they are. That could be uh, mischief, it could be danger, uh, and there's, there's a few different characters. Now this is the general setup for the sibling's trouble. It's going to vary depending on the particular scenario that you've chosen. So right now we're looking at the introductory scenario that can be played over again, which is the hillside caves. You begin by constructing your adventure deck with a series of uh, cards that are recommended in the rule book or for set up for every single one. So first you pick a going home card. This is a card that at the end of the game, if you guys are if everybody's victorious. You flip this and you explain the story as how you got home and you know the the final it's, it's the finishing act is what it is. The next two cards are the final boss and the treasure that he's protecting. This stays hidden until a certain point during the scenario. So in this case, it'd be you know, the dark troll is protecting the umbrella. The next part, the next card that you place down is the big secret. Uh, once you flip this, uh, there's a number of different story elements that are added, including uh, you get to see who the big boss is and what they're protecting. And then finally is the entrance to whatever scenario you're doing. So this is the entrance to the hillside cave. And it gives you a story prompt. The hillside cave is hidden. Describe how it is discovered and opened to enter. So you start by putting your adventure deck here. Now you won't be pulling these all one after the other. Uh, you'll be starting with this. So say it's my turn. I would start off. Um, oh, sorry. So to start off, first everybody gets a, an item card. So each of the three players in this instance would get an item card. And you would have to describe how you got that item and why you're bringing it along. So it could be, you know, the handheld game, a shiny stone, or a lucky penny, 1928 penny. And all of these items give you benefits in the game, but you have to describe what they are, why you have them, and, and how they're going to benefit you. In addition to basic treasure, there's also epic treasure, which uh, just adds even more bonuses and they're more difficult to come by. Oh, PB and J sandwich. Now each of these cards is a story prompt. So as you flip them you're going to be given instruction on how to include that element into the story. There are also these Hillside Caves cards. These cards are specific to the scenario. These are going to change depending on which scenario, scenario you're going through. And then there's path cards which are added to the story as well. These, uh, This is a much larger deck they are used for every scenario, so they're sort of the filler information, you know, they're, they're plot points, you know, an underground river, you have to explain, uh, you know, it makes the boss more frightening, which adds a fear counter to it, uh, and then there's a chance to, to get treasure, or, you know, you roll one of these die, the investigation die, which can make things worse or better for you, depending on what you roll. Uh, 
also you could roll this die, which gives you a chance to get treasure as well. So, say it's my turn. I, I'm playing the character Mayhem, and I get to go first. I flip this, I have to describe uh, something that's going to be on this card, and the plot will progress. After that, uh, you sort of consult the rule book, and it tells you which cards you're going to pull next. So the next two turns may be, you know, path cards, and you flip them, and you... Uh, first you find the entrance, and the next thing you find is the Underground River, and you describe how that affects what's happening within the story. Um, you know, you find an amazing place where you get to roll uh, roll a die and see what happens. Could be bad, could be good. Uh, something that I should note is each player has their own special ability. They can activate that when they're in an encounter where they have to roll their own individual adventure die. If they roll their special symbol, they get to activate it. Uh, or, once per game, they can use it whenever they'd like by spending their adventure token and just discarding it. Each player has a unique ability that can help throughout the game. As the adventure progresses and you get deeper and deeper into the cave, the big boss is going to be getting these fear tokens that just make them more difficult to beat. So as that story element, you know, progresses, you add those and you subtract those depending on which cards you get and how the story is told and which items are used. Similarly, there are these uh, plus star tokens, and when, when a player encounters an enemy, they have to roll their adventure die, and they have to basically beat a threshold. So let me see if I can find one here. Yeah, so for instance, you know, cave worms. You have to describe a story element. I uh, won't get too into that. I don't want to ruin anything for you. There's a reward if you beat it, but this star value here is what has to be rolled in order to beat that. So say if I was rolling, I'd roll this. I got a three, so I wouldn't beat that. I can then at that point do a number of things. I can use my special ability, which will, which may or may not help. I can call for help from another sibling, uh, and they can add their adventure die to, to that as well. Or, uh, well actually, if I have any of these on hand, these positive star tokens, I add those and they're each plus one to my die roll. So I would need at least three in order to beat this by myself. And you get those by, through different cards throughout the game. Uh, likewise, there's negative stars that they, you hang onto these until you roll the die, and they are pretty much the opposite. I mean, these are modifiers in terms of an RPG game. These are tangible, physical modifiers that you can easily um, toss on and you know, toss into the discard pile when you're done with them. The players win when they complete the scenario. So that's the sibling's trouble. And I, I have to admit that I was pretty skeptical about a light game that took such strong storytelling elements and attempted to force that onto players. And that, I think, is the very first thing I need to talk about, is that the players that are playing this need to be involved. They need to be um, willing to put themselves out there. Because anytime someone creates a story or adds to a story or does anything creative, they're putting them a piece of themselves out on the line to be critiqued. Um, That isn't something anyone should worry about in this type of environment. If you're playing with the right kinds of people, they're not going to, honestly, they're not going to critique you on your storytelling ability. This is a game that was made to have fun, as was Dungeons and Dragons, as was Call of Cthulhu and Pathfinder and the Serenity role-playing game. But they're a different type of experience. You're not confined by um, rolling a die, moving three spaces, end of your turn. You are encouraged and have to incorporate elements from each card into your story. I mean, it's you have to incorporate the elements into your story in order to get some of the bonuses for the card. So knowing that right off the bat, knowing that you need to go into this game with the mindset that you're going to be contributing to a story and realizing it's a different type of activity, it's a different type of feel than a lot of other board games. You're not sitting down and uh, placing red cards on red and eights on eights. What you're doing is you're collaborating with the other players. It's a cooperative game where you and however many other players, up to four players, I believe, yeah, two to four players, are coming together and you are building something together. You're building a unique story that's going to change every time with the amount of cards that are in this game. That's a terrible thing for some people. That That is honestly not a fun thing for a lot of people. Um, it was for me. And I was surprised with the people that I played this game with, who have no experience in role-playing games, how fun that ended up being. Because we allowed ourselves to uh, become engrossed in the story, and as silly as it was, which it was, I mean, our, our troll bad guy ended up being Theodore Roosevelt, who hadn't actually died and become a troll and he was protecting, you know, a, a mystical umbrella. It introduces the role-playing genre to kids, at, uh, honestly, at a pretty young age. A lot of uh, young kids could handle this game because 
You've got big, thick cardboard tokens. There's only one die that you really have to, to manage for your own individual character. Yeah, I I really liked this game. It was, it was a very interesting take. It's not something I'm going to pull out with heavier gamers or um, my D&D group. This isn't a game that, I mean, we might try it once, but honestly, we have other adventures to go on that scratch the kind of itch that this would much more satisfactory, if that makes sense. This is a game that I could play in 30 minutes. Uh, I cannot say that about any role-playing game that I've played. And so it fits into a niche in my collection that I did not know was there. Uh, a short-form role-playing storytelling game uh, that has this cooperative, collaborative sense and and because of the nature of the game, there's really no quarterbacking. I mean, in in a lot of, in a good number of cooperative games, one player can dictate exactly what the players have to do. In this one, it's up to the player's imagination. And while that is awesome for some people, it's not great for others. So if you're interested in that, if that sounds interesting, the idea of a collaborative storytelling game that can be played in a short amount of time, definitely look into The Siblings Trouble.